Hi, my name is Amberly, and I have the privilege of serving as one of our executive pastors here at Transformation Church. We just wanna say thank you so much for tuning in from wherever you are watching from. And if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. We believe that God has a word for you. So let's jump into this amazing message. Come on, Transformation family. I think we can do better than that. Let me hear. Let me hear how great your God is by how great your praise is today. Come on, let's pray together, Father, for this incredible privilege. And it is a privilege. We see it that way. We are grateful for the privilege of experiencing your presence. Our greatest prize most valuable asset it's you so in this moment we thank you for you thank you that you're in this room moving in our hearts strategically pos positioning us for what you have next we stand in great anticipation of that thank you for this incredible house this city you set on a hill this spiritual family that you are literally using to shake nations and thank you for the the privilege today to contribute to what you're doing in this house so we know your word cannot be taught or understood without the assistance of your holy spirit our helper so would you help me to teach today and would you help your people to receive to the end that is said of us as it was said of the early church these are they that have turned the world upside down in Jesus name amen come on transformation one more time man listen so first of all I'm super excited to be here always an honor to be in the house I kind of feel like I'm not uncle status yet I'm not claiming that I'm not that old I'm not uncle status but I'm I'm brother how about that I'm brother I just feel like a a, um, a brother of the house and really really grateful uh, to be here and man just to, just to see you and to and to witness to worship with you and to witness what God's doing here and he's doing some incredible things I want to know is there anybody in the building anybody online that loves your church what so man we we celebrate this man and 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 I, I just I celebrate your pastors I've learned this. God's greatest gifts never roll in your life on four wheels. They walk into your life on two legs. He put his greatest treasure in people. And um, I was talking to Pastor Mike early, probably about a week ago, and I was just sharing with him how some conversations that we had resulted in some really significant, important shifts that I was making, some in life and some in leadership. And one of the things I, I was sharing with him, I was like, Mike, I think... You are so anointed, so engaging, so charismatic, so gifted in so many different areas that we all can be inspired by that, blessed by that, caught up in that. But one of the things that I've been able to discern is not just when you're adding value using the gifts that God's given you, but when something is shifted and now God's talking and each week that he stands on this platform you're not just getting messages from God's word you're also getting a word from God and how many love your pastors and and um so man so so grateful for them and to to the captain and mama Todd I just want her to I wish she just called, just voice memo me prayers every morning. That's, that's it. Just send it to you, boy. I, I, I need that. Such great gifts. And also honor to the bishop and uh, the incredible mantle that is on his life and how God is and continues to use him. All right. So I'm not uncle. I'm brother. So <laughs> keep telling myself that. So. I want to continue in the stream of sermons 
that have been released to the house from this series, Damn, It's Not Destroyed. And I want to read a few verses from a book of the Bible named after a prophet named Jonah. I'm going to be reading Jonah chapter 4, read a couple of verses beginning at verse 1. And it reads like this. It says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing the Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God. Slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Listen to what Jonah says, family. Listen. Jonah, the prophet says, now, Lord, take away my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. I want to stop the reading of scripture right there and talk from this subject in our time together. Three words. The breaking point. The breaking point. Clap your hands if you're ready for God's word today. The, the breaking point. So family, I, I want to ease into this introduction by offering an axiom that I came across several years ago that's going to be the foundation of our time of teaching. And for my note takers, the axiom is the following. More of anything means more of everything. More of anything means more of everything. More of something in one area means more of something else in another one. Here's the way Jesus framed it. He said, to whom much is given, much will be required. You rarely get more of what you do want without getting more of what you don't want. This is what I've affectionately entitled the backside of every blessing. The backside of the blessing is the burden you don't see that comes with the blessing you do see. The backside of the blessing is the burden we don't want that comes with the blessing that we do want. This is in part what I believe the Apostle Paul is capturing in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when he says that because of the abundance of revelation I received that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. He says concerning this thing, I sought the Lord three times that it might be removed from me. And on the third time, God said, my grace is sufficient. Notice what he says. He says because of the abundance of revelation that I got, I also received not just revelation I receive warfare the revelation is the front side of the blessing are y'all following me the warfare is the back side of the blessing more responsibility is the front side more stress is the back side more notoriety is the front side. More criticism is the back side. More influence is the front side. More attacks are the back side. More square footage is the front side. More expenses are the back side. More locations are the front side. More agitation is the back side. More promotion is the front side. More pressure is the back side. You do not get more of what you do want without getting more of what you don't want. And this is why it's essential that we trust God's timetables for delays. Because sometimes we're upset, agitated, frustrated, irritated because we're waiting on God to send the front side. And God's like, I'm not holding up the front side because you're not ready for the front side. I'm holding up the front side because you're not ready for the back side. You're gifted for the front side, anointed for the front side, called to the front side, chosen for the front side, capable to handle the front side. But I'm not delaying you because you're not ready on the front side. I'm delaying you because you got to get ready for what comes on the back side. 
David, when I put you in the palace, you got to dodge spears and not throw them back. And you're not cut like that yet. You still got a little throwback in you. So I got to delay some things in your life so I can work some things out of you so you can handle not only the front side, but the back side. I feel like preaching in transformation today. If I get the front side without being prepared for the back side, then what was intended to be a blessing ends up feeling like a curse. So a key, listen to me please, to the blessed life is backside management. The front side brings the light. But if I'm not prepared, if I'm not equipped, then the backside will bring damage. And this is the damage that we don't talk about enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We talk about the damage that comes when we're stuck and when we're stalled and when we're plateauing and things aren't moving and things aren't progressing and it doesn't seem like the windows of heaven that are open, uh, that are open over our life. I want to tell you there's another type of damage and there's a damage that, that can come when the opportunities are coming so fast you can't wrap your head around them. There's a damage that can come when you got so many people around you that are keeping you company but because you don't know their motives you still feel lonely. There's some damage that can come when you are greatly used by God. Watch this because you cannot be greatly used by God and not periodically exploited by people. It can't happen. That, that, that's the backside. So in our time together today your brother not uncle <laughs> Your brother wants to use the book of Jonah as a teaching tool to help us get ready for the backside. Let me tell you why we should be excited. Because as soon as you let God fix what needs to be fixed for the backside, he's getting ready to blow your mind with the front side I don't know who feels me in transformation nation but I just need a few people to give him a prophetic praise for what he's getting ready to do while you're working on me for the back side I'm gonna praise you for the front side I'm not where I'm going but I'm not where I used to be so I'm gonna praise you in the hallway Yeah, the, the text today offers us some insight because if we don't learn to manage the backside, the damage from the backside might not destroy me, but it can destroy my destiny. Here it is, family. It's, it's, it's in the text. We, we picked up this story in Jonah chapter Four, but we can't grasp the content in Jonah chapter 4 without getting some context in Jonah chapter 1. And in Jonah chapter 1, we're introduced to Jonah receiving an assignment from God. He should be honored by this assignment. He's not new to this. He's true to this. He's not a novice prophet. He's experienced. He's trusted by God to deliver with surgical precision the prophetic proclamation for the people in Nineveh. God says you got the personality, you got the temperament. Jonah's probably wondering why me? And God's probably saying, Jonah, you asking why me? Because you don't know who you are. You, you, Jonah don't you know that I told Jeremiah before I formed you in your mother's womb I knew you don't miss it he said Jeremiah I formed you your parents made you but I formed you 
That, that, that the only thing your parents could do was engage in the act to conceive you. And once they engaged in the act to conceive you, they lost all control. Everything from that moment on was up to me. Your gifts, that's me. Your temperament, that's me. Your personality, that's me. Your strengths, that's me. I made you the way you are because I made you with your calling in mind. And Jonah, I know you probably don't want to go to Nineveh because you're agitated by Nineveh. But your agitation is often, Jonah, an indication of your assignment. Did you hear what I just said? I said your agitation is often an indication of your assignment. I call this unique agitation. Why Darius? Your purpose is always an answer to a problem. But you will be uniquely agitated by the problems you've been called to solve. So both of us can walk in a room, both of us see something wrong, it bother you and did not bother me. And because it doesn't bother me doesn't mean I don't have a standard. It may mean that not, that's not the Goliath I've been called to knock down. Did you hear what I just said? And I don't know who this is for, but when you get a revelation of your real purpose, you start saying stuff to the enemy like, I'm a problem. <laughs> yeah, I'm a problem for the problems that you don't want me to solve. I'm a problem for the problems that you want to keep people tied up in. I'm a problem for the problems that you want to use to destroy and to detour and to discourage people. But am I talking to anybody that's sick of not walking in a full revelation of who you actually are? I need some people in the room today that will unashamedly say, I'm a problem that's why the enemy is after me because I'm a problem that's why he won't leave me alone because I'm a problem that's why I can't seem to get a break because I'm a problem because he wants me so consumed with my own problems that I can't focus on the problems that he's called me to solve but you know how to give him a nervous breakdown you know how to make him agitated is that you start solving problems for others when you can't solve problems for yourself God tells Jonah there's a problem in Nineveh. You've been born to address it. I'm getting ready to introduce you to Jonah, one of the reasons you were born. I want you to go down to Nineveh and I want you to declare my message. And Jonah, being the anointed, articulate, faith-filled, faithful, fearless leader that he was goes in the opposite direction. <laughs> no, no, no. The text, the text says, God says, go to Nineveh. And the Bible says, Jonah arises. And text says, first of all, he goes down to Joppa. Everybody say down. down. Come on, say it better than that. Say down. Yeah, he goes down because anytime I'm going in the opposite direction of my assignment, it always leads to down. Text says he goes down and he goes to this port and he pays a fare and gets on this ship heading to Tarshish. So wait a minute, he could have went to Nineveh for free. <laughs> But he has to pay a fare to go in the wrong direction. Because whenever I'm going in the direction that is opposite the direction of my assignment, it's expensive. It costs me. It's going to cost me time. It's going to cost me energy. It's going to cost me focus. It's going to cost me joy. He paid a fare to go in the wrong direction. And this is what's interesting. <laughs> what's interesting is that he's not running from ethics. He's running from an assignment. What's, what's, 
what's, what's interesting is he's running from a part of what God has called him to do that he believes puts him at risk. I'll explain it later. Here it is. So he gets on this ship. He's headed in the wrong direction. And the text says, while he's on the ship, the Lord sends a great wind. So the wind starts blowing. I'm going to say that again. Because very often, when Jonah's story is told, the first thing people talk about is the whale. But when you read the story, what God sends first was the wind. Somebody say wind. wind. Come on, say it again. Say wind. wind. Yep. He uses natural circumstances to try to get Jonah's attention. He sends the wind before he sends the whale. But Jonah is so intoxicated with his emotions, his discernment is impaired. So now he's missing wind warnings. So the wind is blowing and Jonah doesn't discern that the wind is a warning. So the Bible says in verse 17, <laughs> this storm gets so great that the mariners who are on the ship start throwing cargo over to try to reduce the weight on the ship so they can keep Jonah on board. Now, if they were responsible for transporting cargo from one place to another, that cargo was valuable. So they had to throw their values overboard to keep Jonah on because that's what happens when you harbor a fugitive. Yep, Jonah is unaware of how his unwillingness to align his life in this season with God's assignment for him is having indirect implications on other people. So the text says, all this is happening and Jonah is in the ship, sleep. Because the people that cause you problems are often very unlikely to take responsibility to help you fix them. They wake him up. They engage in this superstitious practice of casting lots to see who is and what is the cause of this storm. The lot falls on Jonah. Jonah realizes and recognizes I'm the problem. And Jonah then says to the men, throw me overboard. Now, wait a minute, Jonah. You are a grown man asking other grown men to throw you over. We didn't help you get on the ship. Come on, transformation. <laughs> you walk on this ship. Why is it that you're asking us to get over? Because when I'm unaligned from my assignment, it creates unhealthy codependency. And I start asking other people and expecting other people to do things for me that I should be doing for myself. And the text says, they throw Jonah over. But verse 17 says these words. It says, but God had prepared a fish. 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 God in his providence had seen before what Jonah would do and had made provision for Jonah before he did it. Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying, what if the whale was not judgment? 
What if the well was actually grace? Y'all aren't talking to me. <laughs> Because I want you to see the coincidence in all of this. It just so happens that at the same time they throw Jonah overboard. That just happened to be the time that a whale was in proximity of the ship. I am telling you that God speaks well. Y'all missed it. Everything has ears. And God knows how to speak the language of everything. And I believe the God who speaks well spoke to the whale and said, you need to start moving in this direction now. And the whale just happened to, is there anybody in the room today that's following what I'm saying here? Everything's got, got ears. You remember in, in First Kings there was this famine that hit this region and God told his prophet, he said, I want you to go to this brook called Cherith because I've commanded ravens to feed you there. Don't miss this family. People feed birds. Birds don't feed people. But when God is trying to get provision to his people, he will temporarily change the nature of a thing and make a raven, which is normally a taker, become a giver because he speaks raven. Come on, talk to me, church. Yep, the, he speaks well, and the well, the text says, swallows Jonah up. What if we've been calling the whale judgment? But the whale is actually grace. Pastor, where do you get that from? Listen, I'm not an animal expert. But I'm an expert Googler. And I did some research. And I discovered something. That whales, please don't miss this family do have teeth. Whales also have digestive enzymes that break down the food that they consume. But somehow, Jonah, don't miss this, is in the belly of the whale, not torn to pieces by the teeth and not decomposed by the digestive enzymes. He's in the middle of the well, but he's whole. I need to pause for just a second. And I want to know, am I talking to anybody that can testify? Pastor, he didn't keep me from everything, but he kept me in everything. I might be in a well right now, but I'm not falling apart. I'm not torn to pieces. I don't look like what I'm going through because he's keeping me together in the middle of it all. Family, this is grace. <laughs> this is a personification of the gospel. This well is preaching the gospel to us. This is gospel personified because the, at the essence of the gospel is this truth. That God has the ability and that God has made a commitment to rescue humanity from a predicament humanity got itself into. Yeah, come on, come on. I know that. I know that shake that religious tree and that upset that Pharisee spirit. That's why Schleiermacher says the grace, that grace is scandalous because it upsets legalistic people. But, but the story of the gospel is one man, Adam, breaking it. And another man, Jesus, fixing it. The story of the gospel is God saying you are human enough to get yourself into it. But I'm God enough to get you out of it. I want to know, is there anybody grateful for the gospel? Yeah. 
Jonah got himself in, but he couldn't get himself out. He deserved to stay in. He earned his stay. Come on. Some whales are whales we earned. But because of <laughs> because of a concept called propitiation, the satisfaction, the appeasement, a price has been paid. And now God commits to get us out of Stuff we got ourselves into. Yeah, text says Jonah is in the belly of that well. It swallowed him, but it swallowed him whole. And when God is with you, you can be in it and still whole. And the Bible says as he sits in that well, verse 9 says in chapter 2, he sends up a praise. Then the text says also in chapter 9, in verse 9, excuse me, he sends up a prayer. And then the text says he makes a promise. <laughs> he sends up praise. He sends up prayer. And he makes a promise. He sends up praise, sends up a prayer, and he makes a promise. Sends up praise, sends up prayer, and he makes a promise. He says to God, I'm going to pay what I vowed. I'm going to do what you told me to do. See, this reveals to me one of the reasons, besides the prophetic implications of Jonah being in the well and Jesus being in the grave three days, this reveals to, to me, family, this reveals to me one of the reasons he was in there three days. Because sometimes God's got to let us sit in it long enough He's got to let us sit in it long enough until we keep the commitments outside the well that we made when we were in the well. And the Bible says when Jonah says, I'll do what you said, the text says this. It says, and God spoke to the fish. Catch the order. Jonah talked to God. God talked to the fish. Catch the order. Jonah talks to God. But then God talks to the fish. Catch the order. Jonah talked to God. But then God talks to the fish. So Jonah talks to God about the problem. God doesn't talk back to Jonah. I don't know about you, but this bothers me a little bit because when I talk to God about the problem, I want God to talk back to me about the problem. But the Bible says he didn't talk back to Jonah. While Jonah was talking to God, God was talking to the fish. And just because God isn't talking to us about the problem doesn't mean God's not working on the answer. Sometimes God isn't talking to us because God is talking to the whale. And the Bible says on that third day that that whale spit Jonah out. Jonah had no inkling. He had no idea. He didn't get a prophetic word. All he knew was one moment he was in and the next moment he was out. And I'm believing God's getting ready to do something during this crazy faith season. Something crazy like that for some of you that all you will know is one moment I was in it and the next moment I was out. I want somebody to just put this in the atmosphere, say quick. Yeah, I don't know what you're believing for, but I'm just believing that he's going to do it quick. That it's going to be suddenly. That it's going to be expeditiously. That it's going to happen without warning. That one moment you're in the well and the next moment you're out. The text didn't just say he spit them out. The text says he spit them out on dry land. 
Woo! Did you hear what I just said? He spit him out on dry land. This is another powerful picture of grace. He used his mistake as transportation to get him to a destination he couldn't have got to on his own. It is the power of redemption. God will take the mistakes of your past and use it as transportation for your future. He will take what the enemy meant for evil and he will work it for your good quick. Quick, 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 quick. That's why I can't sit down when I come to transformation because he can do it quick. That's why I can't be quiet when I come to transformation because he can do it quick. That's why I'm so tapped in and locked in when Pastor Mike preaches because he can do it quick. He put him out. On dry land. He didn't have to swim back. Whales don't typically even come that close to shore. If you're big enough to swallow a man, you don't come that close to shore. But God will make something break a rule to get you to where he's trying to. And all this happens. This is not even my message. All this Here's the point. I said all I was, I, I did all that to get to this. He goes through all of that. And when he gets on dry land, Jonah 3, verse 1 says these words. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. You see, he says, you still have to do what I said. We've been through all of this, but you still have to do what I said. We wasted three days, but you still have to do what I said. And I know you think you disqualified you, but you didn't call yourself, so you can't uncall yourself. If I say you still have to do it, then you still have to do it because you were born for this. Jonah, you were surprised by the whale. I wasn't. So Jonah, I'm done. Jonah. <laughs> Jonah does three days worth of work in one day. It should have took him three days, but he, y'all missing this. Come on, is that what the text said? It's a, it's a, it's a, it was a three, then it was a three days journey. Jonah did it in one. Because he wasted three. In the well. But time wasted isn't always time lost. I'm getting ready to run. Yeah. I said time wasted isn't always time lost. You see how God made that time up? He wasted three, but it should have took three to get to Nineveh, and God did it in one because God redeems time. That's Joel 2. He redeems time. What does redeem mean, pastor? It means to buy back. That's what it means. So when God redeems time, he doesn't give me more time. He takes the time I got left, and he does so much. I'm getting ready to run. He does so much in the time I got left that it makes up for all the time I wasted. It means he says, you may have blown three years, but what I'm getting ready to do in the next three months is about to make up for everything you wasted in three years. And if you've never wasted time, if you've never blown an opportunity, if you've never mismanaged a season, then you be quiet. But if you've ever made some mistakes and you need God to spin the block and do it one more time. And the chapter three, Jonah, was ready for what the chapter one Jonah wasn't. 
Oh, we are upsetting the devil today. I said we are upsetting the adversary today because he's been whispering in your ear. He's been telling you because of what happened in your chapter one that you will never get to your chapter three, but your God is getting ready to make open show of the enemy and what he meant for evil. you to that chapter 3 so I'm still going to do it bad English good theology I'm still going to do it I'm still going to do it and the text says here it is Jonah because <laughs> this version of Jonah could steward the same commandment. Y'all are missing this. This version of him, this processed version, this broken version, could steward what the chapter one version of him couldn't. Are y'all ready for what I'm getting ready to say? I said, are y'all ready for what I'm getting ready to say? I think... We got to be careful how we label things. So one of the things I have to remind myself of and remind others of from time to time, don't label this so fast. Don't, don't label this so fast. Because if not, you'll be like the disciples on the boat who see Jesus walking on water and you'll say, it's a ghost. Labeled it too fast. And then when it gets closer, you'll see, and more time passes, you see, oh no, that's God. Y'all missed it. Because what you call in one thing in this season, you're going to be calling God in the next. While you're in it, you're like, this is heartbreak. And God's going to get you to a season you're going to look back at, you're going to say, that's God. You <laughs> While you're in it, you're saying this is failure. God's going to get you to your chapter three. You're going to look back and say, that was God. When, when, when you go through the breakdown in your chapter one, you're going to say this is a breakdown. But when you get to your chapter three, you're going to look back at your chapter one and say, that was God. What I call failure was school. What I call failure was actually school. He was getting me to the chapter three version of me that can handle the assignment. So Jonah faithfully fulfills this assignment and this is where people often, and, and that's okay if they stop depending on how God's calling them to use this passage but for me, I want to be faithful to what's on my heart today and I'm literally wrapping up this is not a preacher clothes, I mean it, this is my last one, here it is here it is he faithfully carries out the assignment so effectively that Nineveh repents watch this so he's winning but then when you read chapter 4 he losing I don't know if you've ever been here where you felt like I'm winning and losing at the same time. See this stuff he was talking in chapter 4 where he's saying he, he's at such a point where he's like take my life. He's that angry. He's talking emotionally. It's because Nineveh repented. Come on family we read it. He said in chapter 4, he said, I, he said to God, I knew you were going to do that. Fresh out the well. Fresh out of the well. He's still smelling like grace. But upset about the grace that God's shown to others. Now, if we stop here, it's lazy exegesis because we could just say Jonah's angry, but anger is a secondary emotion. You don't feel it first, you feel it second. You feel something and then you feel anger. 
You feel misused, then you feel angry. You feel cheated, then you feel angry. You feel betrayed, then you feel angry. You feel hurt and wounded, then you feel angry. This man wasn't just angry. He was hurt. Because Nineveh, here's why he didn't want to go. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. The Assyrians had an adversarial relationship with Israel. So much so, they had a history of decapitating Israelites and placing their heads on fences as a warning to others. So Jonah's like, I know you want to be good to some people, but I got some recommendations for some people on the other side of town you can be good to. So let's wrap up with this. What's happening, Pastor? There is unhealed pain based on Israel's history with Nineveh and Israel's history with the Assyrians that is unaddressed in Jonah and doesn't show its head until Jonah's winning. There's some damage that didn't destroy his gift, but it was destroying his joy. Because some damage doesn't stop me from doing, but it stops me from being. And what's crazy is Jonah probably didn't even know that he was feeling this until it got triggered by God's graciousness to Nineveh. See, because just because I'm not in pain doesn't mean I'm not hurting. Did you hear what I just said? Just because I'm not in pain doesn't mean I'm not hurting. If you will see my father, he's, he's, his pinky finger on the right hand won't extend fully. And the reason it won't extend fully is because years ago when I was growing up, we were playing basketball in the backyard and I hit his finger and his finger broke. And my dad, old school, so he didn't go to the doctor. He didn't let a doctor deal with it. And so what happened was it healed, but it didn't heal right. So he's no longer in pain, but he can't make full use of his pinky. And some of our hearts look like my dad's hands. I'm not in pain, but I don't have full use of it. And I came today, I'm done. I came today for people that are at a breaking point. People that are at a point in your journey where you're saying, Pastor Darius, I've had some chapter three victories. But if I'm honest, I'm dealing with some chapter four emotions. As blessed as I am, I should be happier than I am. As blessed as I am, I should have more peace than I have. I'm used, I'm blessed. And I'm winning, but I'm conflicted. And church, I want you to see God's providence in selecting Jonah. Are y'all following this? Y- y'all following this? For- because Nineveh needed Jonah, but Jonah obviously needed Nineveh. Because these unaddressed areas in the cracks and crevices of his heart don't get exposed unless he gets triggered by what's happening in Nineveh. Come on. And God's like, Jonah, I'm not just using you to fix something in Nineveh. I'm using Nineveh to fix something in you. I want to show you 
that chapter four is still in you, but you weren't born for chapter four. Chapter four is not my destiny for you. And chapter four, listen to me, what you see in chapter four is not kingdom. It's not the king's way. It's three ways you can do anything. Culture's way, church's way, and the king's way. Aren't church's way and the king's way the same? Not all the time. Sometimes those that claim to know him best misrepresent him the most. This is the distinction that Jesus made, turning over tables in church, saying, it is written that my father's house should be a house of prayer. You have made it into a den of thieves. You like it, God doesn't. But not being rich here isn't kingdom. Paul says it specifically. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy makes the rich man jealous. Joy will make Zacchaeus climb a tree. Joy will make Nicodemus come to you at night and say, I got everything except for what you have. And I'm tired of living without that. And I want to know, am I talking to any people that are tired of singing about peace, tired of quoting scriptures about peace, tired of singing about joy, tired of quoting scriptures about joy. But is there anybody at a breaking point in your journey with Jesus where you say, I don't want to sing about what I'm not experiencing. I don't want to have chapter three victories and chapter four emotions. This is what Pastor Mike's trying to get us to. This is why he took a Sunday morning to have a conversation about therapy. Because some of the great, here's the miracle everybody can get on this side. The miracle everybody can get on this side is an emotional one. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. I know what it's like to have chapter three victories and chapter four emotions. But I also know what it's like to let God use your chapter two to get you to a breaking point where you no longer settle and accept abundance in every other area except for the area that actually matters the most. And I'm talking to some people I know to say, Pastor Darius, I want that. I'm at a breaking point. I'm done. That is my third close in it. I'm done. <laughs> but that only happens when you forgive what happened in Assyria. That is the prerequisite to healing. Because when I don't forgive, I become worthy of the same correction I want God to extend to others. And the Bible says when your obedience is fulfilled, then God will avenge all disobedience. Assyria hurt me. You got to let it go. Not because you like Assyria, but because you love you. You have to pardon it. What they took from you, they can never pay. An apology can't pay it back. If they took money, they can give you money back, but you can't give me back the time and the bad days I had because of it. They can't give you what they took. So you have to write it off as bad debt. You have to pardon and say, I accept the blood of Jesus as full and satisfactory payment for what you did to me. You owe me nothing. And I believe that for you and I speak that over your life. Lord, I pray for emotional miracles. Grudges, bitterness, resentment, cynicism that didn't go away with a book, didn't go away with a sermon. Would you work a miracle in our heart? Would you help me to release what I could not release on my own? 
I'm at a breaking point and I want to be free. Heal my broken heart and bind up my wounds. And if you, the son, makes me free, I'm free indeed. This freedom comes not just from preaching. It comes when you come in relationship with a person. And if you are tapped in Transformation Nation or if you're in this room and you've never made the decision to move from a creature-creator relationship with God to a father-son, father-daughter, if you've never made the decision, I'm going to get out of the driver's seat of my life, get on the passenger side, and from this day forward, I want Jesus to be the leader of my life and the forgiver of my sin, my Lord, my Savior. I realize I am incapable of saving myself, and I'm incapable of leading my own life. I need the one who knows all things to have all control. I want to surrender. I want to be saved. And if you've never made that decision, in this room or online, would you allow me the privilege of leading you into a prayer, the most important prayer you'll ever pray? To bring heaven's resources into your heart here on earth. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Dear God, I've, I'm praying out loud. You pray in your heart. Dear God, I admit I've made mistakes. I admit I need a savior. And I ask that you Change my heart. That you change my motives. That you come into my heart. That you change me from the inside out. I believe you lived, you died, you rose again just for me. So change me, renew me, transform for me, transform me. I'm yours. And for the rest of my life, I will live for you as you show me how in Jesus name amen if you prayed that prayer for the first time or you prayed it for the first time and meant it <laughs> there's a QR code that's going to be on the screen or you can visit our website just to let us know you made this decision this is the first step it's not the only step but we're grateful and we're thankful and we believe that heaven is populated and your future is bright because of what he's done in your life today. I want everybody in the room and everybody online to give him the best praise you got left. Come on. And if, if you have a need and you want to receive prayer, there'll be intercessors at the front who can pray for you. Everybody who wants prayer will get prayer. Can I do, it's not my church, but can I do it like it's my church? I'm old school. I pray benedictions. I want you to receive this by faith. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face of favor to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he protect you. May he provide for you. And above all else, may he grant you peace. This is my prayer for your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now go live a transformed life. Thank you so much for watching this message. We pray that it encouraged you. Our vision is to represent God to the lost and found for transformation in Christ. And if you would like to partner with us in giving, you can text GIVE to 82. 8282 or visit us on our website. Also, be sure to like, subscribe, and check out our other sermons as well. Our service begins every Sunday at 1045 a.m. Central Standard Time. Now go out and live a transformed life.